Okay, everybody, for this chapter, we're going to talk about political, uh, political action or things that people can do, you know, to get involved in politics, whether it be voting, participating in political parties, participating in interest groups, and so on. Okay, so, um, you know, political participation, you know, here in the United States, it doesn't really happen often. I think, you know, less than, you know, 50% of the people vote in midterm elections, which are the elections that are in the, you know, between the president's elections, the two-year elections in the middle. Um, you know, we usually have about 40%. People tend to vote in the presidential elections, and, you know, that's a whole other topic that, you know, might be safe for another class as far as why do people vote more in presidential elections than, than, than midterm elections, and even low, lower on local elections. And we'll, we'll, we'll kind of, you know, try to figure out why that happens. Um, you know, a lot of these things are done is uh, to influence you know, the actions or selections of people that are in charge. So some of the more conventional political activities that we have are voting, campaigning, maybe writing a letter to an official, participating in civic groups. Some of these less conventional things involve protesting or terrorism and a lot of, you know, a lot of the more violent stuff that comes out of political action. If we look at this, this graph here, you can see the conventional versus the unconventional and the extent of accus uh, activism versus the non-extent of accus activism. So we have apathy, which is very conventional here in the United States, um, all the way at the top to leadership. And if we go to unconventional and, and you know, we talk about extreme extremism, we have revolutionary and extremist activism and stuff like that. So when we have activists, usually we have our foot soldiers or our people that are activists. And generally, this might be less than 5% of the population. These are activists who do the basic work of politics. Um, and we also have single issue activists where these people normally don't participate. They're active in the political world. But an issue emerges that mobilizes them into a period of high level action. And I think a good one might be, you know, kind of looking at some of the, the Black Lives Matter stuff that has been happening. Uh, in a little bit more um, kind of fever and a lot of a little bit more passion than in in than before with regards to to the death of George Floyd. Um, so that kind of you know maybe might activate somebody or might cause somebody who usually doesn't participate to participate in some type of collective action. And then we have your extremists or these people who do unconventional things like terrorism and 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 you know some violent forms of protesting that we talked about earlier. Let's have leaders and these activists. Um, they succeed in capturing supreme political power within a government and using it with extraordinary ener energy and effect, whether it's good or bad. Um, apart from voting, you know, we have high levels of political activity uh, tend to be uncommon in most political systems. And like the book says, about one fifth of an adult of adults in the U.S. engage in no political activity. And, you know, it'd be interesting to um, kind of look at that figure and I think that might be an underreported figure where you know this might be taking into account voting patterns but if you really look into it you know you even go to you know some more extreme of views of political action whether it's giving money or participating participating in an interest group it's going to be less than five percent of the population that does that um, there are citizens who are willing to uh, engage in activist modes of political participation, such as lawful demonstrations or boycotts. Um, you know, that might be, you know, an example that you might have a tacit boycott in some instances where you might not go to a place because of some of their, maybe their contributions. I know Chick-fil-A was a big um, contributor to some anti-LGBTQ groups and I think so you know that might have hurt them uh, you know in their bottom line where some people might not go there if we look at voting participation you could see here in in the world the different levels of participation you know we're generally right in the middle with the political uh, elections of president here but if we look at like I said a local election or a, a, a midterm election or a primary even you know, our, our figures aren't going to be anywhere close to that. Here's some, you know, uh, some actions that citizens do and some of the representative numbers to it. Really interesting. And maybe a, a little bit of a 
view of how we tend to view politics here in this world, and specifically here in the United States. Now, when we talk about interest groups and political parties, usually these are groups that kind of advocate for an ideology or a position or an issue. Um, interest groups are things like the NRA or PETA or EMILY's List or anti-abortion uh, groups. All of these political interest groups share a common objective of attempting to influence the allocation of public values. And when we talk about this in the United States, this is usually involves money. And, you know, they pursue varieties of strategies to achieve that, pur uh, that purpose, whether it's political action, um, provisions of material resources, exchanging information and cooperation. And a lot of the times, you know, this is involves money. You know, when we talk about resources and a group's behavior, you know, these are elements that are controlled by groups which can influence the decisions and actions of political actors. Um, an interest group is advantage to the extent that, you know, they already have a name, they already have some type of, of, of name value here in the U.S. Um, and they can advocate for a specific position and contribute millions and millions of dollars to a political candidate. Uh, we have associational interest groups, which are groups that uh, specifically are used to further the political objectives of its members or institutional interest groups where we have groups that have been formed to achieve non-political goals. And we go into a little bit more of these non-associational interest groups and anomic interest groups. Now when we talk about political parties, political parties kind of used to act kind of as a conduit between the voter and the candidate. Now I think the media serves a little bit more of that than political parties. But remember, political parties are, are used to broker ideas, you know, socialize people on how to feel, act as that conduit between the candidate and the person and the voter, uh, mobilize and recruit political activists. Um, you know, there's always people that want to volunteer for a candidate or an issue, coordinate government operations and organize sources of opposition. So Political part, uh, participation is a crucial topic, and it's a very interesting topic here in the United States in trying to figure out why people vote and why people don't vote, why people will contribute money to a political candidate, why some people won't. Um, you know, a lot of things that come into it, all right? So this kind of ties up the chapter, and we will talk um, and get on to chapter four in a little bit. Okay, thank you.